Welcome to this episode of Dr. K's Psychobabble. Today we're going to talk about memory. But before we go into memory, I need to tell you about the model of thinking within psychology that we call information processing. Information processing is the habit or you know, methodology or philosophy of equating the brain with a computer. The human brain invented the computer and philosophically we can understand, sometimes we can understand the creator when we understand its creation and inadvertently we've sort of created the computer as an analogy to our human brain. Let's say we're going to be talking later about short-term memory and we sort of equate that to the RAM in your computer. And sometimes we talk about long-term memory, long-term storage, and we might refer to our hard drive and that we may be programmed by our early childhood experiences and we're running scripts. And we see this terminology being used to describe human behavior, but those actual terms arose from the computer world or the information technology world. Now, in truth, the brain will never really be the same as a computer. Uh, at least not in the foreseeable future. The brain is immensely complex. It is the most complex object in the universe and it puzzles us to, to no end. So now that we sort of understand this notion of information processing, that's sort of the perspective that's going to be present in my discussion today about memory. The theory and model of memory that I'm going to present is from that perspective. Now, it's important to recognize that without memory, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. There would be no indication of yesterday or now or my thoughts just a second ago. There'd be no sense of our identity of who we are or what we're doing. Without memory, even in the animal kingdom, we see memory and we see purposeful, directive behavior and whatnot. We see a storyline within our own lives. We establish a sense of self and identity. Everything revolves around the concept that we're able to take information and store it somewhat permanently in our brains. So that's sort of the process that we're going to be talking about. Again, from that information processing standpoint, we're going to be looking at mechanisms that are involved. Now, the brain itself, the organic mass, is incredibly complex. And when we talk about something like short-term memory, we're not talking about a particular little area in the brain, like our little RAM chip that goes into our computers. The entire brain is involved in short-term memory. The entire brain is, is involved in long-term memory, in processing information and whatnot. So even though this theory sort of like goes through these models like a machine, the actual brain doesn't operate that way. But the model helps us understand how we actually remember things. So I have a little bit of a graphic to help us understand how this works. Now, first of all, of course, we start with the brain. Now, the brain is connected to um, a number of sensory organs and it also has internal dialogues and messages that are going on and the sum total of all that information is what we call consciousness and certainly that's worthy of a whole other movie uh, uh, another video like this to cover that now that consciousness comes into us through our sensations. There are internal sensations, external sensations, our eyes, our ears, our skin, the, whether we feel an electric field or we can sense gravity or I feel hungry. All of these sensations go into sensory memory. And you can probably understand that sensory memory gets pretty clogged up. Now the, um, what happens is sensory memory is sort of a combination of the physical structures of sensation that limit what's coming in and the ability for our sense organs to understand redundant information and ignore it. And we don't even feel that. 
And so sensory memory is very, very short. You can actually experience a little bit of sensory memory. Uh, you do all the time. If you ever look at a, um, at a bright window and then you look aside and you still see an image, like an after image, what that represents is that the neurons firing in the sensory organ of your eye are still firing for a little bit. Now, that they've been overwhelmed in that particular, so the, they might be firing for a little while, but the, the fact that the neurons are firing telling you that that is the sensation of our sensory memory. If our sensation blocks it out, if we, um, in fact, are not paying attention to it, it gets forgotten. Now, this attention part is very important because we consciously focus our attention on the things, you know, through motivation or whatever. I'm, I'm in a classroom. I'm going to listen to the instructor instead of listening to this conversation that's going on on the right side of me. Um, when we successfully attend, we take that information and it goes into what we call short-term memory. This is the RAM. This is the information that we then have some processing power with. Now, very much like sensory memory, short-term memory is very volatile. It can be disrupted very quickly if something comes in that's much more attention-grabbing. You can forget what was just in your RAM. Just like if you unplugged your computer, everything in RAM is lost. Now, if something interferes or you're overwhelmed or, you, or, or you've taken your attention someplace else, things can drop out of short-term memory and those things are forgotten. However, that working memory, short-term memory, our RAM gives us the opportunity to engage in a process where we are effort effortly trying to place this information into long-term memory through a process called rehearsal. Now, rehearsal comes in all shapes and sizes. It's all your studying, your practice, repeating, um, flashcards, organizing information, overlearning, everything that psychology has discovered and all your own personal ways in which you go about learning things, all of those all fall into the category of rehearsal. Now, the relative success of our rehearsal, did I practice enough, did I read enough, did I do, you know, did I do enough flashcards, uh, will represent itself that if I'm not able to recall that, that information is also forgotten. If I am successful, however, that information now goes into long-term memory. Now this is where things get, things get sort of interesting. We have this presumably infinite storage of information in our brain. We experience this infiniteness of it sometimes when we're walking along the street and there's a uh, something that you see or something that you smell and this very rich memory of who knows how long ago comes vividly into your brain like where was that stored and here I'm almost re-experiencing that sort of uh, that memory and but the key here is if we have an infinite storage, the problem is access. Just like when we take a file on our computer and we save it onto our hard drive, if we don't have a mechanism by which we're naming or using folders or subfolders, or if we're not organizing that information, it's not that it's not there. It's that we can't find it. And you have all experienced that, where you might be taking a test, for example, and you're looking at the question, you're like, I know that answer. But you just can't get the resolve out of it. And now this process, okay, if you look, go back to the slides here, if you look over to the left part of the screen, I'm gonna have some more information. A cue comes in, you're given a question on a test, a particular smell, you see something, and it's familiar, that engages a process. It engages the brain to go looking for 
queues inside, you know, filing, going through our filing system, trying to find the long-term memory that matches what we just saw. If we are successful, we then take that information out of long-term memory and it comes all the way back into our brain. Now, again, an interesting thing, when an old memory comes into our brain, it actually goes through the memory process again. It's that internal Remember that little up arrow from the brain, internal messages going on, goes into sensory memory. If we attend to that memory, it goes into short-term memory and we can reprocess it. And that reprocessing can sometimes change the original file. Just like when we bring up an old Word document or something and we, and we do an edit in it and we change that file and we save it, we've saved the original file. So our, our own memories are both a record of our sensory experience and a record of our editing. Every time that we've gone back and looked at that memory, it comes in and it goes through this whole process of consciousness and sensory memory and short-term memory and processing again, and it's liable to get changed. So. That is how the memory system works. That's, we have information outside and inside that we experience through our sensations and inside of our brains. We process that into short-term memory. Through the process of rehearsal, we can change or add new information into our long-term memory. And hopefully we've done it well enough that when we're given a cue, like a question, then we have the ability to find that information and score well in our test. So that's it for today. I hope you remember to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.